Europe's biggest budget airline cancels 2,000 flights. It's affecting hundreds of thousands of passengers. Ryanair says it doesn't have enough pilots to cover holiday leave. But what are your rights as a traveller? This is Inside Story. Hello again, welcome to the programme with me, Peter Dobby. The cost of purchasing cheap tickets on low-cost carriers has proven costly for hundreds of thousands of passengers. Ryanair, Europe's biggest budget airline, recently cancelled some 2,000 flights. The company says the decision was because of a scheduling blunder among its pilots and cabin crew. Well, as you can imagine, that decision sparked immediate outrage from frustrated passengers. The CEO, Michael O'Leary, was forced to apologize, saying Ryanair, quote, messed up. To make matters worse, travel insurance companies have told many of the travelers that hotel and car rental cancellations will not be covered. Here's some of what Ryanair passengers had to say. Every year I say I'm not going to fly with them again because of the way they treat the staff and the conditions, the paying conditions, and I really, but then of course the British we say that, don't we? And then we actually go ahead and book again. It's cheap so and cheerful, isn't it? cheap and cheerful. Yeah. So cost is the main and issue. And you get what yeah. you pay for in life, don't you? Unfortunately, not good. <laughs> if you paid and you want to go away on holiday, you know they should have really sorted it out. It's really a bit odd that a big company like Ryanair would make such a big mistake. But hey, it's not the first time airline cancellations are followed by customer outrage. Earlier this year, frustrated passengers were arrested after fighting with airline staff at an airport in Florida. Spirit Airlines blamed a staffing problem and pilot unions for cancelling its flights. Dozens of passengers were stranded at their gates in long queues. And in April this year, a disturbing scene on board, a United Airlines flight made headlines around the world. A video showed a passenger being dragged down the aisle of a plane after refusing to give up his seat on an overbooked flight. It was shared thousands of times on social media, sparking debate about passenger rights. United Airlines pledged policy changes for overbooking and has subsequently reached a settlement with the passenger. OK, let's bring in our panel in London, the Independence Travel Editor, Simon Calder, and from Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada, Gabor Lukács of Air Passenger Rights. Welcome to you both. Uh, Simon, what are the big issues here? Well, very embarrassingly for Ryanair's point of view, they got their fleet planning, their crew planning completely wrong. Um, they have told me in some detail that uh, uh, basically the way that they computed the pilots' leave um, had been changed subtly, um, but uh, it simply meant that while they actually had too many pilots around in uh, July and August sitting about in case there were any problems. Come September and October, they haven't got enough. They've got to give vacation to all the uh, uh, pilots that, that are on their books. And as a result of that, and some complexities involving flight time limitations, they have had to cancel over 2,000 flights. Now they say, oh, it's only 2% of our total flying program, but if you are Europe's biggest airline by passenger numbers, then that is going to affect an awful lot of people, up to 400,000, I calculate. Gabor Lukács, what does this mean for the passengers and what does it mean about uh, how they can claim compensation? From a passenger perspective, this means that passengers who have paid for their tickets and who are relying on the airline to carry out its obligation under the contract of carriage are suddenly find themselves without a flight. In such a situation, passengers have two grounds for compensation. The first is the European regulations, which provide for a compensation up to 600 euros, depending on how far the flight was going, the distance that was to be flown. However, there is a less spoken of, but more powerful instrument, so-called the Montreal Convention, which provides passengers with the right to seek compensation up to 5,000 pounds. And passengers are urged to use that because uh, that instrument actually allows you to claim uh, also for items like your pre-booked hotels or your resort or various activities at the destination. The law is general. And in this case, it's quite clear that Ryanair 
is in full control of this problem in the sense that they failed to take reasonable measures to ensure that the flights would be operational. Simon, given Ryanair and given it, its corporate identity almost, because these things are always a trickle down, Ryanair has always displayed a kind of a catch me if you can way of dealing with its passengers. Everything from being slightly dismissive to being downright rude. We've all seen the, you know, the films that people have made on their cell phones, etc. at check-in. So that's the ideal scenario that we're hearing just now. I mean, the reality is what for those passengers? Well, the reality is, uh, Peter, shifting all the time. Um, and it reminds me, actually, uh, some of your viewers may remember the volcanic ash crisis, which swept across Europe in 2010 and actually uh, grounded far more passengers into the millions of people who found their, their journeys wrecked. Um, and the European rules, um, which were just referred to, uh, are very, very generous when there is disruption. They say, Effectively, until the airline can get you to your destination, they must pay you for your hotels and pay for your meals. Now, as soon as the ash cloud descended, Ryanair said, we'll pay for one night, we're not paying for any more. Eventually, of course, the regulators said, no, but you're not allowed to do that. You've got to adhere by the rules. Similarly, in this case, um, in particular, the uh, difficult question of whether Ryanair is liable to fly people on other airlines, in other words, go to Air France, Lufthansa, British Airways, EasyJet, and say, OK, you have to, uh, we will buy a seat for, for Mr Dobby because we've cancelled his flight. Again, they have said early on, we're not going to pay for anybody's. Then the regulators got in touch and said, um, you've got to read the rules more carefully. And they were told that they must do that. In terms of compensation, I mean, these 400,000 passengers, or at least over 100,000 of them, are well placed because of the European strict obligation to pay compensation if your flight is cancelled and it is within your control. So they'll get actually between 250 euros and 400 euros. So that's $300 to maybe $450 um, in cash compensation. But it's the other costs which are very much going to be an uphill struggle against an airline like uh, Ryanair. It's based, of course, in Ireland, which means that uh, anybody who wants to claim, even though you know, its main business is done from the United Kingdom, they will have to pursue Ryanair through the courts in, in Dublin. So while I agree that the Montreal Convention on paper confers all kinds of rights for passengers, uh, actually securing uh, your, your, uh, your losses is going to be, I fear, a different matter Let's broaden the picture for a second. Gabor Lukács there in Halifax, Nova Scotia. When you collate different claims from different passengers to do with different low-cost carriers around the globe, where does Ryanair figure in that, in that scale of treating the passengers properly or not? All, all low-cost carriers tend to have a level of belligerent attitude toward passengers. But I must correct Simon in the question of jurisdiction. A passenger who purchased a ticket in the UK and whose final destination is in the UK can actually sue Ryanair in the UK. Under the Montreal Convention, you have a number of places where you can sue. One of them is the place of business through which you purchased the ticket. The other is the place of business at the final destination, which if someone flies from London to destination and back a return ticket, the final destination would actually be in London. So passengers who are from the UK are in a perfect position to go after Ryanair in the UK. Passengers who are elsewhere within the Euro Europe or anywhere, whatever is the final destination, they can sue Ryanair there under the Montreal Convention. Simon, and that is there, will be pardon me for interrupting you, Gabor, but, but we could have another conversation about international aviation law and how it's administered, but that's maybe a different programme. Simon, was this a perfect storm as far as the negatives here were concerned? Because they had to take, the pilots had to take their leave all at one time. They're losing pilots from Ryanair to people like Norwegian, people like Jet2, and the legacy carriers, you know, BA, Air France, Lufthansa, they must be loving this, surely. Well, they are, as are the um, uh, rival airlines such as EasyJet, which is the second biggest uh, low-cost carrier in Europe, as well, of course, as Wizz Air, based in Eastern Europe. They are having a fantastic uh, time because Ryanair, while it meets many of the criteria that many of us would set for 
a, a, an airline, basically, uh, is it safe? Yes. Is it on time? Usually. Is it uh, a low cost? Well, yes, generally it, it is pretty much the, the lowest in the market. Um, yeah, we, we get a perfectly good service out of Ryanair. I've been flying them for well, over 20 years. And um, of course, like most people, I've said, oh, never flying those again until the next deal comes around. Um, and so, yes, in terms of a perfect storm, it, it has been. It has been one which, uh, if you are working in crew planning, um, you should be able to spot a problem coming down the road and certainly to blame an administrative mess up as uh, Ryanair did kind of, I think, doesn't give us the full picture. Yes, pilots are leaving. Yes, Ryanair has said we're going to take on 125 new pilots, but it's not quite as straightforward as that. You don't just, uh, it's not like um, getting a, some taxi drivers in, you know, you've just got to teach them the basics of, of getting from A to B. You actually have to go through an operator conversion course. So it's going to be messy. They believe that once the winter schedule begins, which will be on the 29th of October, that the number of flights goes down, um, so the problem will kind of go away. But it may well reappear once we get to spring, because of course, in Europe, that is very, very seasonal aviation. It's huge demand from Easter, really, through to uh, September. So it'll be interesting to see if a shortage continues then. In general, of course, um, flying is expanding at a compound rate of about 5% per year and pilot numbers are not expanding at the same rate and they kind of need to or you get some very difficult situations. Gabor, let's focus in on that idea of expansion for a second because Norwegian, respected onboard Wi-Fi, you have to spend 30 euros to get a hot cup of coffee, that's a low budget carrier, of course it is, but they've just been green lit to start flying across the Atlantic. When that kind of major development in, in, in the, the story of an airline takes place, do you anticipate more complaints or fewer complaints given the nature of the airline and how they run that individual business? Or do we have to offset that against the reality of being a low cost carrier? People often choose which airline to fly based on the price and don't fully account for the consequences of this is actually a low cost airline. It has no real respect for passengers and is based on the premise that you will come back to us anyway because we are the cheapest. In the international context, especially in the context of transatlantic flights, I anticipate that this is going to cause some problems because uh, we are talking here about large distances where the consequence of a delay or of a misconnection is far bigger, can be far more substantial financially and otherwise than for uh, hopping from here to there within Europe. OK, let's bring in uh, Terry Tozer now, who joins us from Kinross in Scotland. He is formerly an airline pilot. Uh, Terry, your friends in the aviation industry, what are they telling you about the shortage of pilots and if pilots are leaving and the kind of numbers that we think they are leaving to go from Ryanair to other carriers? Well, I think they are leaving. Um, the the um, increase in the pilot market or the demand for, for pilots is definitely bleeding um, air crew away from them. Um, it's very hard to get accurate figures on it, but I think at the end of the day, Ryanair have always run their crewing levels very, very tight. And so it hasn't really taken very many to be out of the loop for this problem to occur. Am I right in saying as well, Terry, that Simon was picking up on this idea that rosterers who plan an airline and what it does, what its staff does, what, they, what its staff do, I mean, they should get that right. Is there another dynamic here? And it's this. If Ryanair is basically offering golden handcuff contracts, that's fine and dandy. But it takes three months to resign from an airline, three months to be trained by an airline. So potentially, Terry, Ryanair passengers may see exactly the same thing this time next year. Well, that's perfectly true. And of course, that's not even allowing for other people who might can start leaving in even bigger numbers. Um, and, you know, there is a, a definitely a discussion to be had about rostering practices in the airline industry generally and in Ryanair in particular. Simon, is this a PR problem or a PR disaster for Ryanair? Oh, um, I, I think probably it, it will be seen as a PR disaster. Because previously, yes, they haven't. They, they've been fairly confrontational to passengers, but the the essentials of a, a safe, punctual, cheap flight have been maintained. If your boarding pass is now becoming a lottery ticket, and you simply don't know if the flight is going to take off, then that is a huge problem. But as much as it's a problem for 
Ryanair, it's also a huge problem for its rivals. And that is because of the practice of Ryanair of saying we are yield passive, load factor active, which sounds like a bit of an airline jargon, which of course it is. All it means is that we want to fill our planes to 90 something percent of capacity. We will cut fares as low as necessary in order to get people on board. And I'm just looking today in London, you can certainly fly to France for under $7, pretty much anywhere in, in Europe, uh, journeys of, of uh, maybe 2,000 kilometers, so 1,200 miles, uh, that will cost you a little more. That, that's more like 13 or $14. But this isn't plus tax, plus charges. This is the price you will pay. And it's pretty much through the winter. Now, with prices like that, which of course Ryanair hope to make a profit from by selling you allocated seating, selling you that expensive cup of coffee or, or whatever, it's putting huge pressure on its rivals. EasyJet, Monarch, Jet2, Wizz Air, Norwegian. All of these companies are going to have to respond and it's going to be very, very difficult for them to do so. So while Ryanair tries to bring itself back from this PR disaster, the other airlines are thinking, this is going to be a horrible winter. We did, Terry Toza, uh, ask uh, O'Leary to appear on the programme. He's yet to get back to us. They don't answer the phones outside office hours in London Monday to Friday, of course. But the people that we have been able to get to and, and giving you some quotes here, Airline pilots working for Ryanair anonymously saying the atmosphere was toxic. They constantly feel undervalued. Is that unique to Ryanair or is that the low cost end of the market? Because whilst they fly surely short haul routes, they do long haul days. They do these split duties where they have literally seven hours off overnight to go to a hotel, sleep for four hours, get on a plane and then fly the next load of people back home. Yes, I think, you know, this has been something that's gone on in the industry for many years. I've experienced it myself. I think the number of things that have changed is that, um, you know, you, you have a situation in some low cost airlines in Ryanair, for example, where they they deliberately have not enough crews. And so therefore, when they have a problem for crewing, then they lean on people to work on their days off um, and to come in earlier or to go home later. Um, we now have these new IATA rules, which are um, much less restrictive than um, the original UK rules. Of course, Ryanair is Irish and they're different as well. But you can have a situation now where a crew can be getting out of bed at two o'clock in the morning to go to work and flying a 13 hour day. Um, it is not realistic. And ultimately, there's going to be further consequences. Gibo Lukacs in Halifax, how strong, how, how much fortitude do people have to have when they want to go through that legal process that you've outlined for us. You know, you've got a wife, you've got two or three kids, you're on a cheap ticket, it all goes wrong. And maybe it might be easier and less stressful. You've just walked away from it and said, OK, we'll do the same thing again in six months. Unfortunately, many people give up. Uh, I always tell people that if everybody is willing to give up, then things are not going to change. The only way we passengers can cause a change in the market is by ensuring that airlines have a cost attached to disobeying the rules, a cost attached to not respecting their obligations, their contractual obligations to us. So it is a difficult path, although there are some law firms that specialize in such matters which can help to take the burden off you. But I think it is an important and well worth path to ensure that it doesn't happen again. Simon, to flip this around for the next couple of minutes, if you want to fly with those low cost carriers, should the ticket actually say buyer beware, you know what you are going to get, you know how aggressive some of them can be, we're being told, we know how undervalued and underpaid some of the cabin crew can be, we're being told. So if you fly with these bucket shop jobs, what do you expect? Well, I can absolutely see that some people will be thinking that, and indeed the so-called legacy carriers, like uh, uh, well, everyone from, from um, Alitalia to uh, the American carriers, are going to be saying, yes, uh, yeah, we treat you right. Well, 
they did accept, I would suggest, in the very important matter of overcharging us um, huge amounts for many years. And now, thankfully, um, partly because of the incredible success of low-cost airlines, particularly in, in, uh, the, in Europe, in North America, in Southeast Asia, and in the, uh, the, the Gulf region, um, there are many more opportunities to fly at a, uh, a, a reasonable price. Um, I, look, I travel all the time, mostly um, within Europe, mostly on low-cost carriers. I'm not aware of being disrespected. I you know, meet professional people doing a good job. Sure, they would like to have more money. Sure, I'm very concerned about uh, pilots um, not, not being properly rested before they are flying. However, you keep coming back to the fact that British and Irish airlines um, such as Ryanair and EasyJet have astonishingly good safety records and ultimately you know, that is the commodity that I think people value above all else. So therefore I, uh, I'm as a consumer absolutely celebrating the choice we have both within Europe and spreading worldwide now in terms of um, excellent airlines with very good fares. It's great time to be a traveller. Um, it's also, of course, correct that they need to look after the uh, passengers. They need properly to, to pay up when they mess up. Okay. Um, but I think the sorts of problems we're having here are, are problems that many other parts of the world, particularly, say, Africa, would love to have. OK, Gabor Lutkic in Canada. I guess this is about pleasing the pilots, the investors and the passengers. Can any low-cost carrier please all the people all the time? It may be very difficult, uh, and this is part of the problem, that what we see currently is a race to the bottom. In order to have to be more competitive, airlines offer lower and lower price and therefore cut more and more services, but very little is done actually in terms of efficiency, in terms of more efficient technologies. In the long run, what I would like to see is more professional standards across the airline industry, which everybody has to meet, and therefore the way to make more profit will be to adopt better technologies and not by offering less services. Terry Toza, there was an unusual um, irregular display of contrition the last time that Michael O'Leary talked about this kind of issue in public. Could this be the beginning of the end for him? Because the share price has dipped. Well, uh, who would know? I mean, it, 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 can't have, it can't have done him any good. Um, you know, I would have to take contention with what Simon Crawler just said about um, everything being fine and rosy in the low-cost airlines. I mean, it has had a massive impact on the industry. The quality of life of the people working in it has plummeted as a result. You can get into a philosophical discussion about some destinations like Barcelona and Venice that are sick to death of being swamped with tourists who are just there because they can get there for 10 quid. But in fact, um, on his point about Ryanair and EasyJet having a good safety record, yes, they do. Um, there are many cases in Ryanair's case where um, that has been partly good fortune and um, there's no doubt that the effect of the low-cost airline industry has sucked up um, the money that used to be put into training and costs in, in other uh, less large and less successful airlines and the smaller regional carriers have been having accidents. Um, they just don't make the headlines. and. Um, the other thing you have to bear in mind is that crew fatigue is almost never um, cited as a case um, for a, an incident or an accident because the investigators find it very hard to prove. So don't dismiss it. It's there. It's a factor. Um, and there have been stories um, confirmed um, of not necessarily Ryanair in this instance, but, you know, two pilots, the only two pilots okay. on the flight deck falling asleep put, on final approach. Pardon me for interrupting you, Terry, too. As a last final point, briefly, um, to uh, Simon Calder. Simon, undoubtedly, all the low-cost carriers, they're softening the edges of how they deliver the thing they do. Will that be enough to guarantee the incomes that they have? I think so, yes. I mean, it's if you look at the uh, profits at Ryanair, they are staggering, which is why I think it's extremely unlikely that Michael O'Leary will be going anywhere. He's very well regarded by the board and by the investors. Uh, EasyJet, also very popular. Norwegian, very, very ambitious. Um, the airlines, which I think are going to be having problems, are the legacy carriers, particularly the smaller ones. We've already seen Alitalia effectively being declared bust. Exciting times to be a traveller, but I think 
I wouldn't blame the low-cost airlines. I'd perhaps blame the passengers for what we are demanding and what I think, which is good, we are actually getting in the 21st century in terms of low-cost aviation. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thanks to all our guests, Simon Calder, Terry Toza, and Gabor Lukacs. And thank you to you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime via the website aljazeera.com. And for more discussion, check out our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Also talk to us on Twitter at AJ Inside Story or at Peter Dobby One. From me, Peter Dobby, and the entire team here in Doha, thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. Bye -bye.